This is part two for chapter seven and eight PowerPoint. All images within this PowerPoint or this presentation are in the public domain. Please email me if you have any questions. As we finished up part one, we were talking about the three types of colonies and the various degrees of independence each colony had been granted by the throne. Now we move forward and this idea of gaining independence for the 13 colonies collectively was gaining quite a bit of attention and so um, we're going to focus on the growing war, the growing um, reasons for war. So we're talking about American Indian resistance, um, the Pontiac's Rebellion, there's all kinds of issues on the frontier and trouble with the Indians and the American colonists wanted the British to give them more and more help, but the British were very busy on their own with wars against France, wars against Spain, wars in Europe, and so they didn't feel like they had the money, the time, or the soldiers to spare to protect the colonists against the, the Indian disturbance on the frontier. Because the colonists were complaining about all of the Indian attacks and a lack of protection from the British, and because the British purses were empty, they felt like they were totally justified in putting into place various taxes to help finance the empire and also the taxes to help pay for protection against these Indian attacks. Now, these taxes were placed upon the British, or excuse me, these taxes were placed upon the colonists without the colonists' permission, without even asking or referring to them. And the Sons of Liberty, led by Samuel Adams, took full advantage of this and enraged and inflamed the various uh, flames that existed and really kind of stoked the flames. And brought to everybody's attention the horrible abuses and tyrannical acts of the British. Other leading figures in Massachusetts and Boston and Northeast, we had Thomas Paine. We also have Paul Revere, Paul Revere and his Midnight Ride, um, but he was a very active agent within the, the Sons of Liberty. John Hancock, one of the wealthiest individuals on the East Coast, <coughs> gained most of his fortune from mercantilism. <coughs> and then we have, of course, the leading lawyer of the colonists, John Adams. John Adams was Samuel Adams' cousin. Please take, t please take the time to read about the Boston Massacre, the, the bloody massacre, is this here, is this image um, propaganda? What do you see? What do you see? Do you see the British soldiers firing on innocent civilians? Or are they acting on self-defense? But the British had become trigger happy, you might say. But was it justified? Some of the leading characters involved, we have, of course, the African-American Crispus Attucks. We have the British General, Thomas Gage. He was in charge of the troops, not the specific uh, regiment that fired, but he was in charge of all troops in Boston. Interesting to note that John Adams, John Adams agreed to defend the British soldiers. So he was able to tr uh, take a, a different perspective um, in the end, two of these British soldiers, two of these British soldiers uh, received a punishment of branding, um, but the rest were acquitted. John Adams defended the British soldiers, and Samuel Adams was not very happy about it, his cousin, but John Adams was insistent upon the necessity of even our enemies, the British, the necessity of everyone to have the right to a fair trial, that the Americans can't complain about being 
denied their rights and then at the same time deny the rights of others. So John Adams was able to put himself kind of on another level and eventually this does him a lot of good when it comes to the first and second Continental Congress eventually becoming then second president of the United States. Boston Tea Party is another example of the way the Sons of Liberty took advantage of a situation and inflamed it a little bit. This is a famous image of the Boston Tea Party, but the Sons of Liberty reacted to the Tea Act of 1773, and uh, they pledged to boycott the tea and organized a group of colonists dressed as, in, as Indians, and they destroyed the property of the throne by dumping 240, 342 chests of tea into the, that should be tea, into the water in the British Harbor. It was almost to the point where they were testing the British king, testing Charles, or sorry, King George's resolve. Almost daring him to do anything about it. So in response to the Sons of Liberty and the, and the rebels of Boston, in response to their destroying the king's property, the coercive acts were put into place and these were laws designed to punish, to punish Boston. Now the colonists reacted by calling these acts intolerable, unacceptable, so this cartoon here, take a look, this cartoon or this drawing in the paper and what it depicts here. So the full caption here at the bottom reads, The Able Doctor or America Swallowing the Bitter Draught. And so this is the British here, the British pouring this down the patient, patient's throat. So the intolerable acts or tea down the throat of America, a vulnerable Indian woman whose arms are restrained by the Lord Chief Justice Mansfield while Lord Sandwich and notorious womanizer pins down her feet and peers up her skirt behind them, Mother Britannia, well, weeps helplessly. The British cartoon was quickly copied and distributed by Paul Revere. take a little time here to look at this idea of mercantilism and the way in which the British strongly looked as, at the colonists as agents to provide the British with finance. That's mercantilism. So just this concept that the colonists were expected to furnish products needed in the mother country. They were to refrain from making or exporting certain products that were maybe in competition with British products. They were also to refrain from buying imported manufactured goods exclusively from Britain and not to indulge in these, this is key here, not to indulge in the bothersome dreams of economic self-sufficiency or worse, self-government. So you can find those quotes on page 114. And then also we want to look here at the menace of mercantilism and how this idea of mercantilism stifles this economic initiative and imposes a rankling dependency on the British agents and creditors and mercantilism kept the colonists in this state of perpetual economic adolescence. It keeps the America from growing, from becoming mature. It keeps them in this perpetual state of economic adolescence. Because of mercantilism, because of the various taxes, because of all of these perceived abuses and tyrannical acts of the king, 
the leading delegates among American colonists started to gather together and discuss, discuss potentially an economic boycott and also send a letter, a letter to the king discussing the grievances and petitioning for redress, petitioning the king to act responsibly and to pay attention to the colonists' grievances. First Continental Congress.